Are all evils caused by insufficient knowledge? All evils are caused by insufficient knowledge is what David Deutsch has called the principle of optimism. A reason this is called the principle of optimism is that it means that whatever is going wrong, whatever the evil thing is, whatever we no longer want or do want but don't have, is just due to some lack of knowledge. In other words, ignorance on our part. If we try to create knowledge, seek solutions and search for answers, then with an effort, sometimes great effort, we can find them. Logically, this is simply equivalent to problems are soluble. But there is some confusion, I think, following deeply entrenched traditional religious memes about how evil should imply intent. This too is a moral claim, of course, about how words should be used. I guess the idea evil must entail intent comes from the idea that there was once considered to be anger of the gods or other beings. So natural disasters have traditionally been interpreted in the pre-scientific era as evidence of the gods' anger. When we learned lightning was just static electricity sparking, we regarded there as being no intent. So God's anger, or perhaps the anger of demons or whatever, was not there. So how can lightning be an evil? Even avowed atheists inherit this way of speaking and thinking to some extent. Evil can only be evil if there is intent. As Solzhenitsyn wrote, quote, The line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. This can be interpreted in a number of ways. Here's two of them. Firstly, there are mystical type forces, Satan versus Yahweh, say, or even just psychological forces pulling the soul or mind in one direction or the other. Or secondly, people possess genuine knowledge, the good, and far more ignorance, sometimes bad, and the latter can cause real suffering. People can also sometimes know what just isn't so, and that's a form of ignorance which can also cause suffering of an even worse kind. The first force type way of thinking can be a useful way of framing things but it can also mislead one into thinking that all evil actions must be motivated by evil intent. But they need not be. Even if evil philosophies, dogmas of all kinds, can act very much like psychological forces. But there too, a person is a victim as much as they are an active agent. Their intents are shaped very much by ideas they learned on mother's knee and for which they only have partial responsibility because they are only dimly consciously aware of them. Many ideas are unconscious or inexplicit and if one doesn't know one even has an idea which is directing one's behaviour, to what extent is one responsible for that idea? It is often just rank ignorance that causes a person to commit an evil act. People can intend great good, have the best of intentions, and yet they are so profoundly ignorant and mistaken, they cause the worst kinds of suffering. It's been well documented that certain kinds of suicide bombers apparently feel nothing but positive emotions of joy, ecstasy and elation. Even if these emotions aren't actually positive in any ultimate sense, the intentions of these people are said to be good. They'll send their victims to heaven, to eternal paradise, where they can eventually be reunited with everyone they love. So do such people have evil intents? Well, on the one hand, clearly not. They are motivated, on some accounts, by deep love, as perverse as this may seem. But it's evil nonetheless. Their intentions don't matter to the evil of the matter at hand. Intention does, of course, make an important difference in a legal sense, though I might personally disagree with some of what the legal system has to say about this. For example, that mental illness is a defence because the intentions were different, but this is beside the point for now. There is a clear difference between accidentally knocking someone into traffic and deliberately pushing them. There, intent is everything. In either case, a civilised legal system shows compassion, but in the former, where it's an accident, it might very well result in no jail time at all, while in the latter, a deliberate pushing of someone into traffic should probably result in a person being locked up until a very good explanation is known about whether one is predicted to do that sort of thing again. I personally recall quite vividly having a thought myself at around about the age of eight when I was in Catholic church, hearing about all the ways we might end up in hell and how salvation might come through baptism. I reasoned myself into what I thought was the best possible thing that could be done for the newly baptised, swift death. 
Indeed, what would God think, I wondered, if someone took an angel of death kind of position and went around quickly murdering anyone newly baptised so they went straight to heaven and didn't have the opportunity to sin and therefore end up in hell? And what if this angel of death that went around murdering people who were baptised, what if their thoughts were, well, even if I personally get sent to hell for all of this murdering, I feel it's worth it because I've saved so many souls. Wouldn't God look favourably on such a serial killer? Wouldn't that be almost like what Jesus would do? Self-sacrificed in order to save the souls of so many others? Why don't well-meaning true believers just murder babies straight after their baptism? Why don't loving parents? Are they selfish? After all, babies are necessarily innocent and will go straight to heaven once the original sin had been removed. I personally, at that age, couldn't find a logical loophole. And to be honest, today, I still cannot, except that I've relinquished much of the religious mindset. My point here is that intention can be for the greatest good, even though terrible suffering, evil, follows. And why? Because it's the ignorance that makes the difference here. A serious lack of knowledge about reality. There is no supernatural heaven and no God to reward such an angel of death. But if one remains unconsciously in a religious mindset, one thinks evil, necessarily, has to be about intention. One might say a person has evil intent and only people can be evil and so on. In reality, let's just observe that the typical evil genocidal dictator seems to think they too are doing good by purifying the world. They have, in their mind, good intentions. Of course, we see their behaviour as abominable. I think it more parsimonious to just say problems can be an evil, a hazard, a real threat to life, liberty and the pursuit or actualization of happiness. But if one insists only people can truly be evil. Very well. The terminology doesn't matter to the principle of optimism, which runs deeper than whether we use the word evil or something else. Lightning that strikes an innocent child is, we must admit, a bad thing. What is a bad thing? A problem. In particular, a problem that causes some kind of suffering rather than one which elicits joy. A bad thing is an evil thing. It doesn't really matter what words you use. I like David Deutsch's formulation of evils are due to insufficient knowledge. I think that's quite right and it follows in a lineage of usage of that word that tries to capture something of its fundamental relevance to morality. And of course illustrates, therefore, a deep connection between what might have been hitherto thought of as the separate domains of morality and epistemology. But if some people would rather just say, bad stuff is caused by insufficient knowledge, or just problems we'd rather not have are caused by insufficient knowledge, or even suffering is caused by insufficient knowledge, then so be it. It seems that these are just logically equivalent ways of saying the same thing. All bad things, from murderous intentions to murder itself, from traffic jams to jamming fingers in doors, from earthquakes to being hit in the head with rakes, from falling downstairs to attacks by bears and solar flares. These are all bad things and all are caused by our lack of knowledge. If we know how to prevent people having murderous intentions, we should prevent them. If we can find the knowledge needed to predict and stop earthquakes or mitigate their destruction to zero, we would and should if we could. It all means the same stuff. I'll continue to call these things evils. Of course, an earthquake has no intent as such. It's not motivated. Twisting a moustache and concocting plans about how to hurt lots of people. It literally feels nothing panpsychists aside. But then apparently, nor does a psychopath feel anything, or rather, anything but joy, although I'm not convinced about this. And, once more, this highlights other kinds of approaches to morality and epistemology that call themselves objective, but in fact, fall back into subjectivity. They fall back into what's going on in your mind and how does a person feel kinds of thinking. That, objectivism, is at heart subjectivist. For that reason, actual objective morality and epistemology says, feelings are not the criterion. Private thoughts are not the criterion. What matters is what goes on out there in the real, ontologically objective world. Are problems being solved or not? Are they being exacerbated or not? Problems being solved, that's good. And being exacerbated, that's an evil. Why would problems be exacerbated? Because someone somewhere, perhaps everyone, is lacking sufficient knowledge. 
periodically in Australia, many lives and homes are lost in bushfires or forest fires. One reason is that very well-meaning people do not want so-called backburning to occur, the reduction of fuel in the forest, in the bush, the preemptive burning of forest and undergrowth around people's homes. Well-meaning people don't want the environment hurt. Others didn't want people hurt from the smoke coming from the backburning. No one really intends and no one can really foresee huge bushfires across Australia. Bushfires exacerbated by insufficient knowledge. And the death and destruction that occurs periodically with these fires is a real evil. And no one really intends evil. Modulo arsonists, but again, many of those are children ignorant about the possibilities and others even more ignorant than that. Evil isn't a parochial property of individual minds, although it can be that. It's just a problem that causes suffering. And natural disasters on this view are an evil to be solved. Or they're just bad things. I don't mind what you call them. Postscript. Earlier in this piece, I say that the intentions of people are good, and the example I use is that the intentions of certain kinds of suicide bombers might be thought of as good. They want to send their victims to heaven. When I say that their intentions are good, I'm merely conceding the way the words intention and good are often used. Namely, if one feels one is intending to do good, then on this view, one really is intending to do good. But there's a philosophical subtlety here. One can intend to do good and yet still have bad intentions. Let me explain. This is the difference between subjectivist morality and objective morality. On the former thesis, the subjective morality, things are good to the extent that people think they are. It might be you yourself in your own life, or it could be a kind of consensus, a greatest good argument. On the subjectivist view, it's about feelings and or personal psychological states, including states sometimes referred to as beliefs. So if you really truly believe or feel that you're trying to do good, then in some sense you are on this view. But on the objectivist view, that's all mistaken. It doesn't matter how you feel. It matters what happens in the world by the measure of are problems being solved or not? Now on that view, your intention doesn't matter a jot. Your intention can be utterly mistaken. Moreover, because morality isn't about personal psychological states, we also do not condemn a person for that personal psychological state that was mistaken. We simply correct them. Error is the natural, near ubiquitous state of things and all of us are, as Popper said, equal in our infinite ignorance. So a person who intends to do good, our proverbial suicide bomber thinking they are sending those murdered souls to heaven, has an objectively evil intent. Their own feelings on the matter don't matter. Murdering innocence destroys the many means of error correction, namely people, and that halts progress in some ways and slows it in many ways and creates all kinds of terrible problems while solving none. That is an objective state of affairs having nothing whatsoever to do with the feelings, beliefs, and other private psychological states of the people involved. We can talk about suffering as a problem, even a painful one, and the solution of it without ever worrying about receptors in the brain or, in abstract moral terms, being concerned about how it feels or why it's unpleasant. We just recognize it's a problem that needs solving. And compassion for others and fast progress in this domain depends on us not getting hung up about who feels what exactly and why. The application of criticism to creative solutions about the problems that harm us most depends on us soberly and rationally applying reason. Everything else is either going to slow us down or cause us to lose focus on finding the solution.